My name is Cassie Bott. I'm a director of climate resilience at ICF, where I work with cities, transportation agencies, energy utilities all around the country on their climate change resilience planning, whether that's vulnerability assessments or at developing adaptation plans or really kind of mainstreaming into day-to-day -day operations. And our panel today is talking about, you know, what are communities around South Florida doing to deal with the various threats associated with coastal storms, sea level rise, and other climate-related challenges. So our, you know, our panelists represent communities all around South Florida at the front lines of these challenges. And so without further ado, I want to let them introduce themselves and we'll get into our discussion. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to South Florida. My name is Dr. Nancy Gassman. I'm the Assistant Public Works Director for the City of Fort Lauderdale. And I've been working in the climate realm since about 2009. Hello, my name is Katherine Hageman. I'm the climate uh, adaptation planner for the city of San Rafael, but previously here in Miami-Dade County um, working on resilience. Hi, my name is Dr. Roland Samimi. I'm the chief resilience officer for the village of Key Biscayne. Um, for the past 30 years, I've been diving deep into the water resources challenges a little bit all over the world from Antarctica to Micronesia to the Northeast and now down here. And um, did my PhD in coastal system science and a couple of master's degrees in water resources and environmental policy and been bouncing back and forth between the private sector and the public sector. Good morning, my name is Hillary Silverstone. I'm the sustainability coordinator for the city of Deerfield Beach and Broward County and I've been working on sustainability with the city for about eight years. Good morning, I'm Sonia Brubaker. I'm the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Miami, and I also serve as the Director of the Office of Resilience and Sustainability. Okay, fantastic. Well, South Florida is relatively unique in being a, a region of the country where folks are already implementing projects to address some of these resilience challenges. So why, why don't I wanna go around and talk about, you know, what kinds of infrastructure improvements are you already making, and do you have systems in place or ways to kind of evaluate their effectiveness over time? Um, I did have a couple slides, if those made it to... Can't you? No slides, okay. <laughs> um, what, the way I think about uh, resilient infrastructure, there's really two types of infrastructure. There's infrastructure that you install to really make a community more resilient, and then there's infrastructure or improvements that you design to be more resilient so that they meet their useful and expected life cycles. So examples of the first are things like elevating seawalls, uh, installing one-way valves in our stormwater system to reduce tidal flooding into roadways. Uh, we're currently investing in the city of Fort Lauderdale about $200 million to improve the stormwater systems in seven neighborhoods. And the, the main performance metrics that we're looking at is a reduction in the frequency, intensity, and duration of flooding um, from all of those various uh, infrastructure improvements. Uh, another thing that we're currently doing is we're designing backup power generation for our downtown storm stations. And uh, kind of an obvious performance metric might be the number of times that we have to use that power generation. The infrastructure improvements that you design to just make sure that the infrastructure you're installing is gonna last for its lifetime, given the challenges of uh, increased groundwater, uh, more intense rainfall, or uh, sea level rise, um, really have impacted our wastewater system in the city. We replaced seven miles of cast iron force main with uh, high density polyethylene pipe which not only is corrosion resistant as it's sitting in salt water because it's within the groundwater table, um, but it also can flex a little bit uh, as the groundwater table rises and lowers with the tide, and that's gonna make it much more resilient to the impacts. We've elevated our electrical panels that are associated with our lift stations so that they don't get flooded during uh, high, high water stands. We've built improvements at our wastewater treatment plant uh, to raise the finished floor elevation of some of the buildings there so that they don't get flooded because that's a critical community uh, investment. Two more is um, we've highly invested in reducing our inflow and infiltration, not only from high groundwater tables and king tides, 
but also from extreme rain events. And the last one is we're, we're buying more high clearance vehicles for our emergency public safety vehicles so that when we have these more extreme events that we can get emergency services to the people that need it. Wonderful, long list. Uh, Sonia, how about you? Hi, hi again. Um, Sonia from the city of Miami. Um, I would say, you know, one thing that we did is we, we we looked at developing kind of strategies and plans. And so we spent a lot of time working with our partners, our neighboring municipalities to develop these climate resilience plans. And now we're actually taking these actions, putting them into practice, um, institutionalizing them throughout throughout the departments in the city to, to get this work done. And, and so one of the things that we did was we um, decided to update our stormwater master plan to incorporate sea level rise um, and flood protection sort of projects. And so we did that in 2021. And from that assessment um, came recommendations of priority projects to add to our capital improvement plan. So we are um, in the thick of it, of um, planning out these projects, designing them, kind of allocating funding towards them. And so one of the things that we did here in the city of Miami is um, we put out a Miami Forever Bond. It's um, basically a general obligation bond um, that the citizens voted on so that we can implement these resilience projects. And, and one of the things, um, and, and really the, the, the great things about this bond is that it's allocating $200 million towards the sea level rise projects. It's a $400 million bond but about half of that is going towards uh, mainly these, these stormwater projects and, and some kind of seawall um, updates. But what we're doing with that is we're able to then kind of use this, capitalize on it, and use it as a match for grant funds. Um, there are a lot of funds um, that are coming from the state currently as well um, as the federal government. And so we're able, because we have this list of projects and this bond, we're able to, to be really strategic and, and be able to um, really a, apply for these grant funds. And it actually takes um, a lot of effort <laughs> to, to apply for, for these funds, um, but because we have this great plan in place, we're able to do it. Um, one um, kind of, uh, I think, a catalyst, um, you know, here in, in Florida, we talk about um, hurricanes a lot. I actually recently moved to Florida this, this summer um, and coming from the Northeast, you know, that there definitely were storms and, and hurricanes, but, um, you know, kind of learning the history, um, Hurricane Irma came in, in 2017. And actually this area, actually right over this bridge here um, in, in Brickell, um, there was four feet of water. There, there's pictures from our, our local newspaper in our financial district, and and while the you know the the, the water receded, um, you know after you know, a number of hours, um, seeing those pictures and seeing kind of that sort of impact was really eye opening for for a lot of the businesses here, a lot of the people that live here, Brickell and the downtown area. Um, it's you know multi use. And so, um, so we've de also developed some signature projects. And so Brooklyn Bay Drive, which is just a little bit south of here, um, walkable, um, it, that was actually where the seawall breached and all that water came in. And so one of the big projects that we're working on uh, is elevating that seawall, installing a stormwater um, pump station, um, and things like that. Fantastic. Rowan, why don't you go ahead? Sure, thanks, Casey. Um, before I get into what we're doing and what we're planning on doing, I think it's important for the audience to get a little bit of familiarity with Key Biscayne because you might not know where Key Biscayne is or what we are. We're a small, low-lying barrier island um, just off of Miami. Uh, we're like one of the first barrier islands in the chain of the Florida Keys and, and a small, vibrant, highly engaged community with very little social vulnerability, shall we say, for lack of a better word. It's actually a core term that, that I find amusing. Um, but nevertheless, little social vulnerability, which is a great thing, works, you know, works both ways. Um, 
And we're threatened by water from everywhere as a barrier island and a low-lying barrier island from the, from, from the sky, from the ground, from the ocean, from the bay. And so people really realize that the main threat is water and water cuts across all, all sectors. Um, so with that in mind, for the last handful of years, the community has, has embarked on planning towards how to deal with this threat um, and, and, you know, looking at uh, undergrounding master plans, developing and upgrading the stormwater master plan and, and other things like that, that set sort of the groundwork for being able to work towards adaptation and resilience for the community in the face of chronic and acute um, stresses. Um, that's led to some short term projects that have been undertaken similar to some of what Nancy was, was talking about earlier. Um, we too have been looking at our, our stormwater outfalls and, and, and how to prevent bay water from entering into it and surcharging the pipes, um, putting backflow preventers on, looking at seawall ordinances. We're putting one in place now to guide residents towards uh, a, a consistent seawall crest height and encouraging living shorelines and hybrid solutions to that shoreline protection approach. Um, we've also been aggressively looking at our aged and disconnected stormwater system, which is really at the core of our resilience effort um, because we have such severe street inundation problems when we have meaningful rain events and how to milk every last bit of function out of that system as we envision um, and move towards a system-wide uh, stormwater upgrade um, that's part of our resilience program. And, um, and how, how to do that just has required us to do very extensive uh, maintenance on the system and, and keeping it functioning while at the same time looking at some, some tweaks that we could do around how well it drains, um, you know, because catch basin drains will regularly clog. And so how do we deal with that? But these are, these are small type of infrastructure projects that are, that are kind of like band-aids. And in truth, what we're really most excited about right now is um, a municipal-wide resilient infrastructure upgrade program that we're, that we're kicking off um, right now. Um, we're sort of building the plane and taking it off at the same time in the sense that we've already got our stormwater engineer um, working towards a 30% design on the first phase of the stormwater system upgrade. Um, we are already working with FPL on undergrounding our electrical utilities, um, mainly because we're having to shift from a gravity driven system to a pump system. But if we're with a, operating with a pump system, now we have to safeguard our electrical supply to those pumps because the system will only work if, if the pumps are, are effectively running. Um, so we got that going on and we're also in the process of developing our integration and implementation plan because at the end of the day, this resilience program that we're, we're kicking off and, and, and getting going with now and it's probably going to run for the next 10, 15 years is looking at, at its core, upgrading the stormwater system. So there's like multiple lines of effort to the program um, and we see it as like five pillars or four pillars of resilience for Key Biscayne. Looking at the stormwater system and how to upgrade that so, such that it can actually clear water effectively. Um, looking at the roadways and how they need to be improved in order to complement the stormwater system, because at the same, at, 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 they're, they're, all in connect, they're all interconnected. You can't look at the stormwater system without looking at the roadways. Um, then we're also looking at utility hardening, which is a multi-pronged effort. It's electrical utility, but if you put the electrical utility in the ground, the telecom utility, has to go in the ground as well because you're taking those poles down. So we're looking at that. And then while we're in the ground dealing with undergrounding and stormwater upgrades, we're also then coordinating with Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department to look at their capital plan and where the water lines and sewer lines are aged out and maybe needing to be upgraded so that we essentially kind of do it all at once. Um, if we're in the ground, we're dealing with it all so that we, we're trying to live by this dig once 
philosophy, which is super ambitious because of all the complications involved in trying to do things in a coordinated way. But we're striving for dig once. Hopefully, we'll be able to pull it off. Um, and then lastly, the fifth pillar of the Resilience Infrastructure Upgrade Program is regulatory updates. And what do we have to do in our community to upgrade our ordinances or our building standards or our zoning in order to set the right environment for um, the, the hard infrastructure changes that are coming? You can't really do one without the other. They all sort of play 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 off of each other. Um, so we're really excited about this, this uh, program. Uh, we're kicking it off. We got a bond voted in two years ago uh, by residents. Um, residents know what the problem is. They live with it. They slosh through it all through the rainy season and, um, and are committed to this effort. Um, now we've got to actually pull it off and, um, and that's going to be a really interesting professional Mount Everest uh, for myself and, and all of my teammates that are involved in trying to, to get this thing, um, this thing going. And I think all of you have alluded that, to this in some way, but there's, you know, the, given the immediacy of the flooding issues and other challenges, you know, communities in South Florida are faced with needing to implement improvements right away, and then also wanting to pair that with longer term strategic planning. So how are you approaching that sort of that second half of that, the, the longer term strategic planning? And I'll let you, you go ahead and build on what you just Sure. Um, well, as I mentioned, this is a very complicated, interrelated infrastructure program that we're trying to um, execute, or like to say implement. Executes kind of negative. Um, and in, in, in order to do that, we, we realize as a small government, we don't necessarily have all the internal human horsepower, intellectual horsepower to do it. So we're really reaching out to the consulting community to help us out. Um, and we have teamed up with, uh, with Black and & Veatch um, and, and, and other firms on their team in order to help us towards developing um, the, the, the right, right size strategy as well as the integration and implementation plan, which is really a roadmap to get from point A to Z um, effectively, efficiently. Um, and, uh, and then they're also gonna be, they're gonna be staying on board as the program manager and construction manager arm of the effort. Um, we wanted them to be part of the strategy development and the integration and implementation plan development um, so that they would get to know the, the village side team well um, as, a, as a critical member of the team and also for them to understand the community and for them to own the cookbook essentially that they'd be living by as program managers and construction managers. All of this is being formulated in this threat vulnerability risk framework um, that guides everything that we're essentially doing. And we can't, we can't really deal with the threats themselves because I mean, we're not gonna fix sea level rise. We're not gonna fix the fact that groundwater is rising. We're not gonna fix the fact that as a barrier island, we are exposed to more intense hurricanes. But what we can look at are our vulnerabilities as a low-lying barrier island with an aged infrastructure system amongst many others, and then start addressing those vulnerabilities to ultimately reduce our risk. Because when you put the threats and you put the vulnerabilities together, you have a risk situation, either high risk or low risk. So our strategy and our integration and implementation plan and our resilience program, which is really, it's an adaptation program at the end of the day. And I try and stay away a little bit from resilience because people fundamentally don't really understand what exactly resilience means. Um, all of that is geared towards looking at our vulnerabilities and dealing with our vulnerabilities to ultimately reduce our risk. So that's kind of where 
that's kind of where the, the, the framework that the model that we're operating under and our hope is that through working closely with our, our external team, that is an extension, really an extension of staff mm -hmm. because we're all really tightly into this together. Um, by working with them, they'll be able to own that integration and implementation plan. It will be aligned with what we believe our needs to be to deal with our vulnerabilities and we'll be able to then properly execute program management and construction management as we move forward through all these different infrastructure projects. And, 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 and I forgot one, which is also shoreline protection. And that's a beach and a bay issue that we're working closely with the Army Corps of Engineers on. But that beach is a very large part of our resilient efforts. And how do you keep it alive? How do you nourish it? How do you strengthen it? And at the end of the day, it is a piece of infrastructure. Yeah, people go sit on it and have a good time, but at the end of the day, it's our first line of defense. Moving, I mean, when you, when you just, like putting aside coral reefs being the real first line of defense, the beach is a line of defense. And so in our mind, that's a piece of infrastructure that needs to be, natural infrastructure that needs to be tended to. Great. Hillary, how about in Deerfield? So Deerfield um, is a little bit unique to its neighbors in that we are a little bit of a higher elevation. So some of the problems that we have aren't quite as apparent as they may be in places like Key Biscayne. Um, and so the way that we have targeted our problems is rather than working with a large, you know, fully encompassing resilience strategic plan, um, we've taken bite-sized pieces and targeted areas where we have apparent issues um, and started working on those rather than one large comprehensive plan. So, you know, one of our, our apparent issues that we have that's, you know, very obvious is that we have a very critically eroded shoreline. Um, and so we've developed a beach management plan to address many of the issues that we see with that. So similar to, to Key Biscayne, uh, we're working on beach nourishment, we're working on dune restoration, and all of those things are outlined in our beach management plan so that we have an outline of uh, how to move forward and target areas that really have uh, the most impact for the city of Deerfield Beach. Another area that we have apparent issues uh, are flooding throughout the city. I, I think everybody <laughs> is right there with us uh, in, the city, in, in South Florida. Um, saltwater intrusion, uh, rising uh, groundwater table. Um, and so we've developed a stormwater master, master plan, which is a little bit more comprehensive than the beach management plan, but does target um, you know, various areas of the city that we really have significant flooding issues, significant infrastructure problems, aging infrastructure. And that plan has uh, identified specific projects that we can address as the years go by we can work towards um, identifying funding sources um, and really lay out a plan for the city of Deerfield Beach to um, become more resilient, but in specific areas. Switching gears a little bit, Kate, I was just curious, you recently transitioned from working on resilience in Miami-Dade County to San Rafael, California. What have you found has been kind of the most transferable lessons yeah, I think another. for me, one of the things that um, is striking going to a new place is the, what a lot of people have alluded to, kind of the difficulty of uh, bridging the fact that we know that there is a ton that needs to be done, you know, and then we have a ton of federal state money available for adaptation, but it takes a lot of work to kind of bridge those two. You know, we had, when I was here at Miami-Dade, we had a politician who was getting pressure for not doing enough about sea level rise. And he said, you know, if I had a billion dollars, I don't even know what I'd spend it on. And I'm sure like Nancy could spend a billion dollars just in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> so, we, you know, when, when those of us who work on sea level rise and adaptation, you know, the, the cost is enormous. There's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be rebuilt, redesigned and redone. But it, um, that infrastructure has been managed by and is still managed by folks in different professional disciplines. And they have different language to talk about wastewater infrastructure or transportation infrastructure and different processes. And so it's a little challenging to kind of figure out how to go in and, and work with your colleagues in each of those disciplines and think, you know, what is resilience? You know, a lot of folks, Miami-Dade is a perfect example, or South Florida in general, like so many folks working on resilience, but it's still a little bit of like a, 
kind of a language barrier, kind of translating, and as Nancy was alluding to, changing codes across different disciplines. A lot of folks like in this room have been doing amazing work changing codes a, a, across those fields, but it takes a, a, um, a little bit of diplomacy to go in and say like, I think we should redo this and do it differently. And, um, and then also, uh, you know, as, as Key Biscayne is encountering, it's so difficult to coordinate all of those um, things. So for elevating a wastewater pump station for 10, 15 million dollars, but FPL leaves the vault at ground level, you know, it's, um, it, can be, it can be tricky and it can be pretty hard to try and get everybody on the same page and make those improvements at the same time. So I think for me, one of the main lessons is just, uh, you know, Again, kudos to everyone in South Florida doing an amazing job kind of pulling everything together in these big teams and, and trying to coordinate and dig once is an aspiration. I think that's a good uh, bumper sticker. <laughs> I think I might, you know, try and um, bring that, that hashtag back. But I think um, trying to accelerate the, the capital planning is really challenging, especially lining it up with the grant funding and getting projects shovel ready is a pro, you know, it takes several years. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of putting lots of heads together to think about how to do that and be ready to take advantage of those funds that are available just for a short amount of time as well. Um, that's one of the main challenges, but obviously there's an, a, a lot of opportunity, a lot of need, um, and just trying to put the pieces together to take advantage of it is one of the big challenges, I'll say. Yeah. Yeah, we are in, in, if nothing but a challenging field, but that's why I like it at least. Um, and so, I mean, speaking with some, dealing with some of those challenges or that transfer by, transferable kind of lessons, if you could give any advice to your past self or, or other cities kind of beginning to tackle some of these issues, what would it be? Sonia, I'll start with you. So advice, um, it really does take a whole city to implement resilience projects. Um, coming into this position, I have worked with almost every single department um, within the city. Um, public works, solid waste, planning, zoning, building, housing, procurement, grants, and more. <laughs> it's just, um, and, and really it's, uh, you know, to be able to really build resilience kind of throughout the city, the, the departments have to in institutionalize, you know, these projects and they have to put it into their budgets. You know, I, I think um, when there's separate kind of resilience and sustainability um, offices or departments, um, they're, they're kind of looked at as, as the policy shops of kind of developing plans, kind of kickstarting um, projects, um, implementing some of them, but really reaching out, um, making friends. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really, really, really important to, to, to work with other people and, and talk about kind of resilience in a way um, that, that people understand um, and, and not use um, certain jargon, certain terms, and, and really kind of show people how it's going to be helpful for their bottom line. I mean, oftentimes there are costs, you know, to implement projects, but really looking at um, kind of the, the economic risk of not doing things, what those costs are, what the cost it is to actually make these improvements, and then what you're going to be saving kind of um, in the in the long run. Um, so, so, so pretty much stepping out of silos. I think that that would be advice that, that, that I have to, um, to, to people. Um, and also to, to, to know that you know, resilience, which is the ability to, to bounce back from, um, from a hardship, from a disaster, um, it's not only about climate change. Um, here in the city of Miami, we do have social vulnerability, as, as many cities do. Um, and you know, it's about affordable housing, it's about um, you know the affordability of paying water bills and, and, and energy bills um, and, and things like that. And so I think really kind of broadening our perspective um, and you know climate is, is such a big part of it. And we do know that um, you know for for lower income households um, it is harder to bounce back 
um, but it's also harder to do all the other things that you have to do every day. And, you know, as we're talking about resilience and sustainability, kind of always having um, those sensitivities kind of in, in the backs of our minds and um, being able to um, be able to talk widely um, so that when we you know talk to people in the community, we're able to address um, many of the problems that they have. And because we know all the different departments, uh, we can make those connections um, and make sure that the everyday stuff gets done. Okay. Cassie, can I just add something Please. to that? Um, if, gosh, this is, this is reaching back out to a gentleman uh, from Brightland. I think his name was Ben, who mentioned something really interesting that his mom had taught him, which was about patience. And if I had to give my younger self some advice, it would really be patience. Because at the end of the day, large infrastructure projects, as he alluded to, take a lot of time. And we are not necessarily living in a world and in a society that appreciates the fact that things take time because everything is moving around us so fast. Um, and the patience thing is, is really patience with ourselves as, as the people that are trying to pull it off, but it's also patience within the community um, because it's challenging to live someplace where every time you're having a uh, you have a meaningful rain event, 75% of the streets in your, in your community flood out, making it very challenging to live your day-to-day -day life um, and also making it very challenging uh, from, a, from a municipal level to deal with emergencies and responding effectively and stuff like that. Um, and so that's an immediate, that's an immediate erosion of your quality of life and your ability to, to, to function um, that needs to be addressed. But resilience and infrastructure upgrading is a long game that takes time and is very expensive. And it requires this delicate balance of patience and action. And that that's a very that's a very challenging um, balance to strike, and it really does require patience and commitment and persistence. But it also requires you to have the ability to communicate um, thoughtfully, clearly, and sort of empathetically to the people that you're serving that all of this infrastructure is at the end of the day for. So, so I, would really, <laughs> I would really sort of tell myself, man, you've got to just be more patient. And you want, you know, we, you want things to happen, you want things to move, um, but things also have this organic timeline. And because of the complexity of everything, as much as you wanna push it forward and make progress, you also have to recognize that it's just going to take time, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, that's tricky. Yeah, absolutely. And we seem to be doing well on time. So I want to ask a follow up question <laughs> about that. Um, as, and for, for any of our panelists, have any of you had success sort of pairing those longer term infrastructure projects with maybe nearer term non-infrastructural solutions, whether it's just communications or kind of maintenance type things. Or in my mind, I think that's one opportunity to kind of walk that balance, like you were just saying, between how long it takes to implement some of these bigger infrastructure projects. And what are some things you can do in the meantime to show some progress, perhaps? Yeah. So I think that uh, the installation of tidal valves is a, a great example of that. A tidal valve will buy you time, um, and it'll reduce the amount of tidal flooding while you work on designing, funding, and implementing a, a stormwater pump station. So uh, there's, there's lots of small things that I think a lot of the communities are doing, putting in a backup generator. Um, and again, that, that just it buys you time. 
And I think a lot of the things that we're doing, the short-term things are buying us time so that we can work on the the big things, the the hundred million dollar investments that we're we're looking at in order to try to address some of the longer term issues. Um, so mirroring what Nancy just said, um, we're trying to buy ourselves time as well um, because at the end of the day, like just say right now, we're in the first phase of, of designing the uh, stormwater system upgrade um, for, for, the, for the entire village. That's a two year design process. And people are like, well, but you know, I'm wet up to my knees like right now. So, so I'm happy that we're doing this design process and I'm happy that it's gonna lead to construction, but what about now? And so what, working with the manager, the village manager, Steve Williamson, and the public works director, we've started looking at like immediate flood control type projects that we could do that aren't significant investments of money into a modification that could potentially be undone as we then go into actually construction of the, the, the true fix. And so, some of these immediate flood control type efforts I, I, I referred to a little bit earlier are like looking at catch basin drains. As simple as it may seem and silly as it may seem, just keeping dirt and gravel and lawn stuff out of your drains to enable them to be able to drain a little bit better will make hopefully a little difference and take some of the pressure off and buy us a little bit of time. Now it's not all the drains, but it's all the ones that are structurally vulnerable to these clogging type effects. We're also using the time to do small demonstration projects. Like we got a grant from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to do a stormwater quality pilot test where we're in, a, in, in the critical area of the village where we're starting our stormwater redesign, we're deploying some mechanical type filtration and some, some filtering technology that is innovative and sponge related to take out uh, suspended solids and metals and grease and, um, and um, nutrients. And we're deploying those things as we're marching through our two year design process to collect the data on the efficacy of these treatment approaches such that when it comes time to actually do the construction, we have a sense for what type of devices will work well to improve stormwater quality to Biscayne Bay. Because at the end of the day, where you know water connects everything and so what we do on the on the land and on the island ultimately has an impact on the bay and the bay is a jewel of the area and the bay is an engine of recreation and quality of life and um and economics and so it's incumbent on all of the municipalities potentially impacting the bay to try and look as to how they might be able to contribute to making the bay better so we're so we're doing these little like a little pilot like that. Um, we're also we also got some money from the state recently to implement a green infrastructure demonstration in in the right of way. And now ultimately we want to reclaim our rights of way because at the end of the day your rights of way are part of the stormwater system in the sense that you can use them for infiltration, you can use them, structure them as swales and use them for storage, you can use them for water quality improvements. So, so during this design period, we're looking at a specific area where we can test out a green infrastructure approach as a complement to the stormwater system. And, um, and we'll see, I mean, everybody speaks to green infrastructure and how great it is or how great it can be if it's done properly, but let's test it out and try it and see, collect the data and determine for sure quantitatively that it is. And, um, and at the same time, it's a demonstration to people. It's like a living showroom that people can go to and say, okay, when we talk about green infrastructure in our stormwater system, 
What do we mean? What does it look like? How does it operate? And they can go there and kick the tires in a way. So we're doing things like that to buy us time. I could add on, and I think one other area that's a short-term thing is making um, data and information more accessible and more visual. You know, you. Um, might not believe how many times I worked on projects where just showing that ground elevation and the potential elevation from a storm surge in relation to a project was eye-opening for the folks that were designing or planning it. You know, you, you think that everybody has this information, but sometimes it's just on a survey. You know, the base flood elevation is all that's used. It's not um, as accessible as it needs to be. So to I think there are a lot of great opportunities just making more... Um, uh, let's say, like used and universal platforms where people can see this is the ground, this is the groundwater, this is the flood depths, and, and design around that. I think that's um, typically pretty low cost and um, can maybe help, or at least in Miami data, it was really helpful in um, brought, you know, making it more part of other people's planning and, and, and uh, planning process. Great. Okay, well, I know we've touched on a lot of challenges over the course of the panel, but um, I guess, you know, what do you see as some of the remaining challenges for your city specifically as you kind of work to advance your resilience or adaptation programs? Nancy? So I, I have four, um, time, setting priorities, money, and the expectations of the public. So in 2022, the city of Fort Lauderdale experienced 178 tides that caused flooding on our roadways, 178. Um, so we are out of time. And while our friends at Brightline are, are working on patients, um, we don't have time for patients anymore. Um, there are already areas, and this goes to the idea of priorities, as we set our priorities, we could invest large dollars in the neighborhood that's most impacted by NAT right now, but we have to ask ourselves whether those investments will be worth, worth it over the time frame that those investments will last. And there are, there are areas in the city that it's already too late for us to install improvements because, because we will never get the value out of out of those improvements um, for that community. So prioritizing where we make these resilience investments, um, cities are gonna be forced to make really difficult decisions about winners and losers, which communities can we invest in that we can continue to let that community be a viable community over time, and which ones is it, is it no longer, the investment won't be worth it. It won't let us get there. So there's, there's really a sense of urgency, um, a sense of, educating our elected officials so that they understand that they have some hard choices to make. Um, and there's never enough dollars. Katie's right, if you gave me a billion dollars, I could spend it by tomorrow. <laughs> Except for, as our friends from Miami-Dade said, procurement and urgency are not always uh, tied together in a public setting. Um, but having adequate money to make those investments, but recognizing that you can't tax or fee your community to death. Um, there is a limit to how much they're willing to spend and how much how much they can spend. And then the final thing is the expectations of the public. Um, I think Roland really uh, sort of gave you a sense of, I'm flooding now, why aren't you doing something now? Um, and, and we can't always do something now. Design takes time, procurement takes time, building things take time. And you have to look at the whole timeline when you're, when you're talking through these issues. And while there are sometimes things you can do in the short term, a lot of times the message you end up having to give them is, please be patient. So this theme of patience runs throughout all of things related to resilience, but it, it's, it's a huge challenge um, to find that balance between public expectations, having the adequate money, and then making a decision that makes good public sense when you're investing 10 or 20 million dollars into one location to try to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Hillary, how about you? Um, so as I mentioned before, the city of Deerfield Beach is uh, at a, a little bit of a higher elevation than um, some of our other communities and you know we're also a very small community so while having maybe less apparent um, issues, we're also very under-resourced. And so we, we have to lean very heavily on 
our neighboring uh, neighboring cities and our partner counties. Broward County has been a great resource for us and, you know, allowing them to kind of guide our way for, you know, how we move forward and looking at um, cities like Fort Lauderdale for, you know, how to make the next steps and, and which steps to make. Um, and, you know, another way that we've approached that is that We've taken on uh, projects that, you know, maybe have a little bit more of a, a financial benefit for us. So, you know, while not necessarily, um, you know, helping with our, our flooding problems and things like that, we've looked at and made several energy efficiency improvements to our facilities to reduce our impact. You know, we've started working on uh, converting our a lot of our fleet to compressed natural gas so that we have a little bit less of an impact and hopefully you know, kind of help to contribute bettering the, the issue overall. Uh, obviously, it's not a challenge that any of us can um, can fix. I think we mentioned that earlier. You can't fix sea level rise, but, you know, at least we can, you know, chip away at it a little bit and, um, you know, do projects that have a little bit of a, a, a financial backing. And that way um, are, are things that, you know, are, are our elected officials are willing to support and make sense for our community and the issues that we face. And Ken, can I get a quick time check? There's a disconnect between my watch and that little timer. So it's two minutes, okay. Yeah, we've got two minutes left, so. All right, so I have a list of about 150 different challenges, but, but one, one of the main ones is, um, is, is back to expectations, and, but it's in a different way in the sense that, yeah, you can expect something to happen now that takes a long time to fix. But then you could also say that, well, we're gonna spend hundreds of millions of dollars to do something, and there's this expectation that it's gonna fix the problem, like 100%. And what's the problem? Wetness. And in truth, you know, we're gonna spend a lot of money and if the expectation is that your feet are going to be dry 100% of the time every day, every year, that's a problem because it's, it's not going to be the case. And so managing that expectation in the face of expenditures of large sums of money to improve the infrastructure across the entire municipality is a major deal. And then also communicating and engaging the public. Um, a lot of times that gets sort of downplayed in the face of all the other things that need to get done on an infrastructure project um, that are like the design, the construction, all this stuff. But engaging the community and educating the community as to what this all means and what they're going to get out of it, major challenge. Um, getting people to community meetings, major challenge. Everybody is busy. Nobody has enough time. And the need to have these meetings regularly so that people are aware of what's happening and how it's going to happen and when it's going to happen and how much it's going to cost, major challenge. And the same goes for the council members. We're steeped in it. We live it day to day, minute by minute, hour by hour, and we know it and we live it and we feel it. But communicating that to the folks that actually you serve, major challenge. I'll leave it at that. Can I just add one quick example that comes to mind in particular is the difficulty of conveying that a project reduces flood risk but doesn't eliminate it. So the Army Corps, for example, has proposed a very large wall here and understandably many folks have reacted uh, to, to, to the messaging that that expenditure of several billion dollars would reduce flood risk and it, it would could reduce flood risk, let me say, uh, but only one type of flood risk. It won't, won't address the, the tidal flooding in Brickell. It won't address the stormwater flooding in Brickell or downtown. It'll help us in a hurricane, but it's really difficult to convey, especially to folks that are working on a lot of different issues like our elected officials, that um, when we say it will help with flooding, that doesn't mean that the flooding is going away. Um, so I think that's one of the main, main challenges everywhere. The, the idea that you can reduce the frequency, intensity, and duration of flooding, but you're not eliminating flooding. That this is flood mitigation, not flood protection. And also what we're doing now is not the end all be all. It buys us time. You know, 10, 20, 30 years down the road when conditions have continued to change and challenge us, what we've just done is gonna have to get redone. You know, and that's also, communicating that is also a big challenge. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, well, that's all the time we have. So thank you so much to our panelists and to our audience. Um, and I think we're, we can't take live Q&A right now, but we're happy to chat uh, after the session during the break.